In this video, we're going to start talking about the inverse sine function. So uh, here we have the graph of the sine function. And uh, what we're going to do is use that graph to get the graph of the inverse. So remember uh, from your pre-calculus in college algebra days um, that a function has an inverse uh, as long as the graph of that function passes both the vertical line test and the horizontal line test. So uh, first of all, it's, it's got to pass the vertical line test or else it's not a function. So we're not going to worry about that. Um, and it has to pass the horizontal line test in order to have uh, an actual inverse. So remember, just a quick refresher, uh, the horizontal line test says that, uh, well, basically a function is going to pass the horizontal line test if uh, any horizontal line that you draw over the graph of that function is going to intersect the function at most once. Okay? So, uh, but here's the graph of the sine function, and we see that any horizontal line that we draw um, is either going to touch the graph uh, nowhere, like if we draw a horizontal line way up here, it's not going to hit the graph at all, and that's fine. Um, but if we draw a horizontal line down here, uh, it's going to hit the graph, let's say, for example, if we draw a horizontal line at maybe y equals 1 fourth. So if we draw a horizontal line at y equals 1 fourth, uh, that's going to hit the sine graph here, 1 point, 2 points, 3 points, 4, 5, 6, 7 points that we can see, uh, but actually infinitely many more points this way and this way. So any horizontal line that we draw here between uh, y equals negative 1 and y equals 1 is going to hit the graph of the sine function infinitely many times. So uh, this graph actually fails the horizontal line test pretty badly. Um, but what we can do is actually uh, restrict the domain of the sine function. So if we restrict the domain uh, so that we're only considering values between negative pi over 2 and uh, positive pi over 2 for x, then what we're going to have is something like this. Okay. So this is now the graph of the sine function, but uh, the only values of x we're looking at are between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. So let's zoom in on that a little bit. Okay, so that's what we have here. And now here we see that this does pass the horizontal line test, because any horizontal line that we draw is only going to hit this uh, at most once, right? So if we draw a horizontal line way up here, it doesn't hit it at all, and that's fine. If we draw a horizontal line right through here, uh, it's going to hit it once, and that's fine. So this graph does pass the horizontal line test, and we can use that to get an inverse. Uh, so remember, um, if you want to get the graph of an inverse function, you take the graph of the function and reflect it over the line y equals x. So here's the line y equals x. Here's the graph of our function, uh, sine of x. If we reflect the graph of sine of x, uh, between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. If we reflect that over the line y equals x, we're going to get this graph right here. Okay. So let's just take a look at that graph by itself. And that's what we have right here. Okay, so this here is the graph of the inverse sine function. And that's the entire thing. Okay, It doesn't uh, extend farther down here or farther up here. That's it. That's the whole thing. From x equals negative 1 to positive 1, and from y equals negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Okay, so this is the point negative 1 comma negative pi over 2 and it goes all the way up to the point positive 1 comma positive pi over 2. And remember, that's, uh, it's the reason that it's only this piece here and nothing else is because, uh, remember back in the beginning, we restricted the domain of the sine function to just be this here. Okay, so since we restricted the domain here, we can only use this piece to define the inverse function. It's one way of thinking about it. But anyway, that's why we only have this piece here uh, for the inverse sine function and nothing else going on. Okay, so let's talk about some of the properties here and how it relates to the sine function. Okay, so like we saw in the graph, uh, the domain is uh, negative 1 to 1 and the range is negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2. Square brackets because uh, we do include the endpoints, those are okay. And here's some notation. Uh, so y equals sine inverse of x or inverse sine of x. So this negative 1 in the exponent here indicates uh, inverse. Or, or we could say y equals arc sine of x. Or we could say uh, y equals a sine of x. So this is a little less common these days, I think, depending on where you are anyway. Um, but that's, it is another uh, expression, y equals a sine of x, uh, short for arc sine. Um, and these all three say exactly the same thing, uh, just the inverse sine of x. Um, here's some properties here. So the inverse sine of the sine of x equals x if x is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. Okay, so remember, that's the nice thing about uh, functions and their inverses. They have that nice cancellation property. But because uh, in order to do this, we had to restrict the domain of the sine function. So we have to worry about this thing here. Okay, so we have to make sure that before we do this, um, for, before we use this cancellation property like this, we have to know that x is between negative pi over 2 and positive pi over 2. 
And so you might be asking yourself, well, what if X is not between negative pi over two and positive pi over two? Um, then how do you do something like this? Well, we'll talk about that in a later video. Uh, so for now, let's not worry about it. But when we talk about how to evaluate stuff like this in a later video, we'll get to that. Um, similarly, uh, sine of the inverse sine of X equals X uh, if X is between negative one and positive one. So here you might be asking yourself, well, what if X is not between negative one and one? Then you actually just can't do this. Because yeah, remember, uh, here we're taking the inverse sine of X first, and then we take the sine of the result. And as long as X is between negative one and one, that's going to cancel and just give us X back. But if X is not between negative one and one, we can't do this part. Because remember, the domain of the inverse sine function is from negative one to one. Okay, so in order for this uh, part right here to even make sense, X has to be between negative one and one. Okay. Uh, but we didn't have that restriction up here, right? So here X has to be between negative pi over two and positive pi over two in order for us to cancel. But even if X is not between negative and positive pi over two, uh, we can still do this, we just can't cancel. And again, we'll talk about how in a later video. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Just one important thing to mention here. Uh, with this notation, uh, the inverse sine of X, so we wanna be very careful with that exponent. So it is not this, it's not saying this, uh, the inverse sine of X, uh, it is not equal to one over sine of X. So usually this negative one exponent means uh, something like this, but for trig functions, it's sort of an unfortunate notation. Uh, but you've just gotta be very careful here that uh, the inverse sine of X is not the same thing as one over sine of X. Okay, so remember one over sine of X, that's the cosecant of X. And the cosecant of X is absolutely not the inverse sine of X. Okay. Uh, this notation just comes from, uh, if we have a function F of X, the inverse function is denoted F inverse of X like this with the negative one in the uh, exponent here. Okay, so that's kind of where that notation comes from. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the inverse sine function. Uh, the other inverse trig functions coming up in the next few videos, and then some properties and some examples.